Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining us on this Saturday and our fifth and final day of Getting Real 2020. My name is Stephanie Owens, and I'm one of the programmers for this edition of Getting Real. And I'm coming, you, I'm coming to you from Tonga, Chumash, and Keechland, also known as Los Angeles. Um, to describe myself, I'm a black biracial woman with walnut complexion and thick black curly hair that surrounds my face and is about shoulder length. Um, I'm wearing a cream and black plaid top and I'm sitting in front of a uh, black text painting and next to a window. Um, uh, just a quick note before we start the session today, um, the closing event for Getting Real is a screening tonight of Through the Night by Loida Limbaugh, uh, which is a co-presentation with the Camden International Festival. Uh, we have 500 free tickets available for Getting Real attendees, uh, which you have to reserve in advance. Um, please check the email or the main event chat for details on how to claim your ticket. Um, and please note that there's a different process to claim your ticket um, if you're inside or outside of the US and all of that is outlined in the email. Uh, trust me, you wanna check your email. You don't wanna miss this film if you haven't seen it. I'm telling you, virtual signature Stephanie Allen, so trust me. Um, uh, so I've had the great pleasure of being in conversation with our speakers from uh, the Detroit Narrative Agency leading up to the conference. And I'm thankful that they're joining us uh, today to share their story. For those who don't know, DNA is a community organization that disrupts harmful narratives about Detroit. It supports black, brown, and indigenous uh, Detroiters to examine and create film and media that build collective healing, power, and liberation. Uh, today we have DNA's three leaders, Cornetta, uh, Cornetta Lane Smith, Ryan Pearson, and uh, Ill Weaver, in conversation with their succession coach, Isabel Moses, to talk about how their uh, organization is transitioning from white to black organizational leadership and um, the impact of that shift to their work and their community. So please join me in a virtual round of applause for our speakers. Hey, everybody. Hi, Hi. good afternoon yeah. or good morning. Good morning, good morning. We, um, we begin also by acknowledging and uplifting the history of Detroit known as Wawiatanang, which is Anishinaabe and other indigenous people's stolen land. Detroit is the largest majority black city in the nation with a long legacy of African diasporic global contributions and was once the last stop on the Underground Railroad known by its code name Midnight. Detroit is also the US city with the largest concentration of Arab Americans, a border city with historic and growing Latinx communities and a legacy of Asian American communities and movements. Our communities have been hard hit by the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and anti-Black racism in the form of state and vigilante violence. We send support and solidarity to the indigenous lands you are tuning in from and the fires, storms, and other immense challenges many of us are facing. We appreciate you making time to join us through all your holding. And now we'll introduce ourselves. So um, I am off camera, um, but the picture you see of me will show well, first of all, my name is Ryan Pearson. <laughs> my pronouns are she, her, and um, I am a black plus size woman, um, cisgender woman, um, honey complexion. And in the picture you're looking at of me, I have on black glasses and my hair is reddish auburn and in long twists with a sassy red lip and I'll pass it to Cornetta. Hey everybody, what up though? My name is Cornetta Lane Smith and I am uh, she, her, I use she, her pronouns and I am brown complected uh, with a, um, with a, a yellow or um, African printed uh, head wrap, um, braid, braids uh, straight to the back uh, with a red sweater and I'm sitting in my office that is the color of, I don't know, it's like a mauve, mauve. I'm sitting in a mauve room next to a window. And with that, I uh, will pass it to Il. Good morning, everyone. My name is Il Weaver. My pronouns are they and them. 
And um, for audio description, I am a gender non-conforming, trans, white, European ancestry, Ashkenazi person. And I am wearing a floral button up shirt and a floral uh, tam hat. And I am sitting in front of a lavender wall. And I'm gonna pass it to Isabel. Hey everybody, I'm Isabel Moses. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a caramel complected black woman with a somewhat wild curly fro today. I'm wearing red eyeglasses and a red and black African print dress with gold leaves. And I am in a green room with some movement, social justice movement art behind me and lots of plants next to a window. All right, so we are really excited to be with you all today. And, um, and we are going to, I just wanna give a brief overview of our session. We are going to share about the history of DNA. We're gonna to talk to you about why transitioning to black leadership matters. And then we're gonna share reflections from our succession planning process to date. And after that, we'll take your questions. So please feel free to put questions in the chat. We may not address them until we get to the Q&A portion, but if we can't address them along the way, we'll, we'll do our best to do that. So we're gonna start with um, Bill, one of the co-founders of DNA. Can you share about the context that DNA grew out of? For sure, thanks, Isabel. Um, so I'll set us off a little DNA context. Um, DNA grows out of years of grassroots media-based organizing here in Detroit. And we're a sponsored project, which means we're fiscally sponsored and supported by Allied Media Projects. And Allied Media Projects, or AMP, um, which also organizes the Allied Media Conference, defines media-based organizing as any collaborative process that uses media, art, or technology to address root problems and advances holistic solutions towards a more just and creative world. Media-based organizing is a community-based process to investigate problems, envision solutions, and then work together to make them real. So we at DNA build on that long legacy of media-based organizing here in Detroit. And to give some examples, there's uh, one of the oldest out black lesbians um, known to be from Detroit is named Ruth Ellis. And she joined the ancestors at over 103 years old, if I'm not mistaken. And she used to run a print shop here in town. And that print shop helped to fund a black queer speakeasy at her home where, um, you know, black queers were uh, transgressing um, what was then considered illegal to be who they are. And then Broadside Lotus Press, one of the oldest black publishers in the country, um, grew out of Detroit. Drum or the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, which was a black led union movement here to push back against um, white supremacy in labor organizing. Um, and they took over Wayne State University South End Press to organize um, black and brown auto workers with leaflets and things of that nature. James and Grace Lee Boggs, um, who Grace Lee Boggs was one of my mentors and they used to put out pamphlets and things of that nature, um, as well as many Detroit filmmakers and media makers such as Juanita Anderson, um, who we work closely with, and Gia Kai, who has also served as an advisor to us, Ron Scott, who has now joined the Ancestors, but did a lot of powerful community media here, and Dream Hampton, um, who's also served in it as an advisor to us and some of the filmmakers we support. Um, so we grow out of that history. We don't um, just start five years ago. DNA grows out of that very rich, rich soil here in Detroit of media-based organizing. So I'm gonna pass it to you, Cornetta. Can you speak more about uh, the media based organizing process that DNA was founded through five years ago? Absolutely, thanks, uh, Il. And you can bring up the slide for this one. So DNA was actually established in 2015. And a year later, we convened an advisory team to host uh, community conversations and a forum uh, and create this visual word map similar to what you see here. And we asked uh, two questions. The first one was, what stories are Detroiters sick of hearing about our city? And this is what they had to say. They said, you know, we're tired of hearing stories of Detroit as a blank slate. Detroit is a crime. Um, and more recently, you know, stories of a comeback city of, you know, Detroit being saved by these white uh, corporate giants. 
um, on the flip side, the second question, the next slide, um, was um, story. What we we asked the question, you know, um, what were stories that Detroiters wanted to hear more of? And they said they wanted to hear more stories about uh, narratives that addressed um, um, systemic root causes and uplift history and legacy of Detroit um, and stories about resistance and resilience. Um, these were the stories that they wanted to hear more of. And furthermore, they told us that they um, that there were some infrastructural needs around telling these types of stories. And so Detroiters needed access to funds, equipment, and mentorship. And this process effectively shaped the guidelines for our 2016 uh, seed grant application and the follow-up fellowship that kind of grew out of that. And so all of this really formed what you, what you see uh, before you today. And so my question to you, Ryan, uh, based on the founding uh, team, with what they heard from the community, what were the grounding intentions of DNA? Yes, um, would love to speak to that. So the grounding intentions of DNA were um, incubating films and media projects to build power and disrupt harmful narratives of Detroit. And we do that through um, the projects that we support and also more recently projects that we co-produce. Um, next was expanding Detroit communities, skills, knowledge, resources, and opportunities in the craft and ethics of storytelling, media and filmmaking and social justice. And we do that through our program. And then um, finally, one of our biggest intentions was cultivating an ecosystem and culture of collaboration between community storytellers, film and media makers, organizers, and social justice movement builders within Detroit's communities and between Detroit and the greater world. And we do this through the partnerships we have with um, local partners and organizations as well as national and international. Um, also, a huge, huge intention is that DNA prioritizes Detroit's uh, communities who have been marginalized and negatively impacted by dominant harmful narratives about Detroit, including, but not limited to, of course, Black, Brown, long-time, lifelong, Indigenous, immigrant, poor and working class, women, femme, queer, trans, gender non-conforming, and disabled Detroiters, and many more. And so, uh, Il, would you be able to share some highlights from the first five years of DNA with everyone? For sure. Let's go to the next slide. We'll give you a little highlight reel. So um, DNA was co-founded in late 2015, so almost five years ago by myself, Il Weaver, in collaboration with my dear friends and comrades, Adrian Marie Brown. And with great support from Jenny Lee, who was the executive director at Allied Media Projects. And so that first picture doesn't seem to be showing up, but that's who was in there is uh, Adrian Marie Brown with some of our um, advisors and Jenny Lee holding her little baby. And um, in 2016, we invited um, an advisory team to shape the priorities of DNA's work and how we approach narrative shifting. So if you go um, to the next photo, it'll show you that um, we brought together an advisory team and that process was similar to what Cornetta just described um, of engaging our communities to tell us what they were sick of hearing, what they wanted to see told. And that was the priorities for our C grant program and first round of projects that went through the fellowship that, that you see here in 2017. And that um, fellowship uh, marked a new era in our team as well. Adrian Marie Brown transitioned out of leadership of DNA to focus on her brilliant books and writing, including Emergent Strategy, um, which is a book we highly recommend you all check out. Um, and the principles of Emergent Strategy, which along with um, my collective complex movements uh, principles or emblems really helped guide a lot of our work. And you'll, have, you'll hear more about that later. So Adrian Marie Brown went to focus on her work with Emergent Strategy and the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute. And then um, when she stepped back, um, I kind of 
became the director, but the intention was always to transition out to um, Black Detroiter leadership. That was always the intention of our team. Um, hey, new interpreter, we appreciate you and we appreciate the previous interpreter. Thanks y'all. Um, so when, when Adrian stepped back, we were like, all right, I'm gonna step into leadership, but the goal is that we bring in um, someone to take on this leadership that's a Black Detroiter that's deeply rooted in media-based organizing work. And so we brought on PG Watkins, um, who was an advisory team member and associate director. They're pictured here with our first round of fellows um, in the 2017 photo, and they worked with us for a year. And then after that, moved, moved on to focus on their powerful work with uh, Black Bottom Archives. But in the time they were with us, we supported five short films and impact strategy um, that went on to screen, not just in Detroit, but globally. And we're just some really, really powerful Detroit storytellers and filmmakers in um, an all black Detroiter cohort with um, uh, Brown and indigenous collaborators as well. And that's what you're seeing in that first photo. Um, and then in 2018, as those films were completed, PG stepped away, focused on Black Bottom Archives, and we knew that something really needed to intentionally be done to make sure that Black Detroiters were at the helm and leadership of stewarding DNA's priorities and values. And so um, we embarked on a learning journey, which you'll hear more about later as well. We brought on some members of our original advisory team and some new members um, of our community we've been partnering with, and that's the next photo. Um, and those advisors came together and joined us in essentially like reflecting on the first few years of DNA, looking at what some of the um, responses and feedback were from our participants from our first few years, what they saw needed to change or needed to stay around. And we also like uh, did a lot of conversations with uh, peer organizations in the field and in the community here in Detroit. And uh, those advisors also helped uh, to start a partnership with the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, which we're developing a short film with now called Reclamation, focused on Black food sovereignty organizations here in the city. And some of those advisory team members uh, supported us in developing a really intentional hiring process to bring on new co-directors. And through that process, the biggest highlight of this timeline, if you go to the next picture, is that we brought on Cornetta and Ryan um, as my co-directors with the intention of, you know, in a year's time, they joined last summer um, to work through a very intentional succession plan so that Detroit Narrative Agency will be led by Black Detroiters who are at the center of our organizational goals and values. And so um, since Ryan and Cornetta have joined as co-directors um, with a lot of support from Isabel, our succession coach, um, we um, went through a process of this learning journey. We launched Ethics and Aesthetics, which is a film screening and talkback series in partnership with Cinema Detroit um, that we hold quarterly and we hope you join us for online. Uh, we launched Radical Remedies, which is um, a short creative video submission pro project. That's a, a rapid response project that Ryan really helped to bring to our team as a way to uh, support our community, especially Black, Brown, Indigenous, Detroiters, and Michigan residents to respond to the dual pandemics of COVID-19 and anti-Black racism and state violence. And then we also um, made a very intentional goal of uh, myself transitioning out of directorship at the end of 2020 into an advisory role and a support role, um, and Ryan and Cornetta taking us into the next five or more many years of uh, DNA's future. And so before we talk more about the process of our succession, we wanted to really um, ground in why Black leadership is so important in this time and in Detroit. And so I would like to invite you, Isabel, back to share more about that and help ground us in the purpose of this work. Thank you. All right, thanks, Bill. So next slide, please. So I want to just take a moment and talk a little bit about why transitioning to Black leadership matters. So we have seen over the last several months a major reckoning around leadership in the nonprofit sector, leadership in philanthropy, and the way in which uh, white leaders disproportionately take up space, particularly in Black and brown communities. And we've seen this particularly play out in Detroit, 
Um, very, uh, so many cultural institutions are led by folks who truly do not represent the communities that the organizations claim to serve and are not fundamentally living their values to their fullest potential. We've seen that in Detroit, where worker-led organizing at the Museum of Contemporary Art has resulted in the termination of a white woman executive director who is who is now suing the museum for wrongful termination. We've also seen that workers are organizing at the Detroit Institute of Art, which is the largest art museum in the city, um, and have also been publicly organizing against uh, the white supremacist culture that is prevalent there. Um, next slide, please. I wanna give you a moment and sit with the two numbers that are on this slide. So as you see, Detroit is the largest majority black city in the United States with about 78% black, um, according to the 2010 census. And uh, Vanessa Daniels wrote a really compelling op-ed in the New York Times about the dearth of funding targeted to women of color led organizations. And as of 2016, the number was 0.6%. And that is, that is not a typo, 0.6% of funding was going to women of color led organizations. So when we think about the real disparity in not just the opportunities for leaders of color, but also the way that funding flows, we're clear that white supremacy is, is a major factor and a driver of this, as well as the fact that without very intentional and deliberative processes, when you do give black leaders the opportunity, very often they are not set up for success. And there are several research reports that really point to this. Um, Building Movement Project did an incredible study uh, called um, Race to Lead that talked about the fact that Black and people of color who are seeking uh, leadership opportunities have the same aspiration, the same desire to lead as their white counterparts, but very often are not given those opportunities. Uh, we also see in, in other data that, um, that when uh, people of color are given those opportunities, they fail often because the funding dries up because of the relationships that were um, engendered by their predecessor, people are not able to continue giving to the black leaders at the same rate, very often. Many times black leaders take over organizations that are in peril or in distress and are expected to work miracles. So when we think about reversing some of these trends uh, at the Detroit Narrative Agency, we're really cognizant of the fact that there are some incredible structural barriers to overcome and that it requires a lot of intentionality to reverse these trends. So with that, um, we actually would like to talk a little bit more about uh, how Ryan and Cornetta came to be the leaders of Detroit Narrative Agency. So uh, Cornetta, can you share a little bit more about your personal journey? And we'll go to the next slide. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, let's just take in this photo because, you know, we worked hard on this photo shoot and <laughs> I just want to shout out Brianne White for uh, getting us um, right on this photo. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so just a little bit about how I came into this work. Um, so uh, you can take it off this, take the slide off now. Um, so I came into this work really because I am a community storyteller and I believe that uh, stories can heal, um, can uh, teach, can uh, do a multitude of things. And um, with my community storytelling work um, in the past, I've seen just how um, community stories, specifically neighborhood stories, can help push back against um, neighborhood rebranding or gentrification in, in the fact that um, gentrification really um, tries to um, eradicate or um, erase uh, history. And so I've seen community storytelling really celebrate community history uh, and and um, tell gentrifiers <laughs> no. Um, and so I've, I've, I've seen that firsthand um, and I just really wanted to see what else uh, can storytelling do um, within an organization? Because at the time I was like by myself doing this work um, with community, I should say. I was doing this work with community. And I was curious, what, what would happen if I joined an organization that focused on narrative work and building stories and community stories? 
And so uh, when I heard about what was happening at uh, Detroit Narrative Agency, I thought this would be my opportunity to co-create a healthy, non-traditional work environment that I had never experienced personally. Uh, I came, you know, from um, a background of a lot of like nonprofit work and um, mostly led, white led. And, you know, as my, ex my experience as a, a, a black person in a manager position or an associate position, I saw how there were, there were always like this, this public facing, like we support black and brown people, but then internally that was not <laughs> necessarily the case. Um, and so I, uh, and so when I saw this opportunity to join the leadership team at um, Detroit Narrative Agency, I thought, man, this is my opportunity to take what I've learned there and not apply <laughs> what I've learned and try to create something that was more healthy and that looked at um, the whole human as, as a person, uh, um, um, not a person, not as an employee, but a person as a person. Um, and so, uh, and so when I got the job, I was really excited because then I got a chance to work uh, with Ryan, who I actually known in Detroit uh, for a good like eight years. Um, and if y'all don't know, Detroit and Detroit is like a one degree of separation. So, <laughs> so like Ryan and I like knew each other um, and and became co-directors uh, with each other. And so, I would like to then turn it over to Ryan to kind of share uh, her personal journey. Uh, into getting to, to DNA. Yep, thanks, Cornetta. So, um, yeah, I am also a storyteller. And it, it's funny because listening to Cornetta tell her story, I'm like, while we both have storytelling backgrounds, they just um, like, just almost like opposite sides of the same coin or something like that. So, I had a more um, traditional background in storytelling in that um, I started off in theater as a kid. So, um, and then on top of that, my family, one of the ways we bonded was through film. And so I've always been a cinephile, always had a deep love and appreciation for film um, and moving image work. And so um, when it came time to choose a career, I knew I wanted to do something in um, theater or media, something that related to this like love for storytelling that I always had. Um, and so um, studied theater in college. Um, and then directly after college though, uh, Michigan had passed um, some tax incentives so that it made it cheaper to make films in Michigan. So I ended up working um, as a production assistant which is an entry level job um, on a film set that is a more technical role. And so even though I was always uh, more of a creative, I, it gave me an opportunity to learn um, how to make films and learn how a set works, et cetera. And so I did that for several years and you know, realized that wasn't necessarily the path I wanted to take for several reasons. Um, one that I, I, in my experience as a black woman, um, or like behind the scenes in that way, I felt like I saw my white, uh, especially male counterparts um, advance quicker than I was. And so um, I didn't like that. And I also, um, being someone who was always a, a bit more on the creative side and loved to do programming and stuff like that, um, it just didn't feel like a good fit for me anymore. And so I ended up getting into um, a lot of arts and cultural nonprofit work and um, lived outside of Michigan for a while, lived in California, and then um, moved back to Detroit and found this opportunity with DNA, which kind of married all of my worlds, which was like storytelling, um, community, especially centering black and brown people in, in our stories. And then also um, media, film, um, and, and just sort of everything that I love and that I value in work. And so um, I applied for the job, clearly got it. And uh, a cute, funny story. I'll share is that initially DNA was only going to hire one co-director. And so uh, Cornetta and I, like she mentioned, we had known each other just like 
in the Detroit sort of like creative arts community for years. And um, she had worked with our fiscal sponsor before. So I, I hit her up when I was applying for the job, like, hey, um, can you tell me more about, do you know anything about DNA and et cetera? And she was like, I'm actually applying for that role too. <laughs> so then we both were like, okay, we'll talk about it after we see who gets the role. Like, <laughs> and then <laughs> and both got the role. <laughs> so, uh, and, and Il told us both that like, they couldn't choose between us because we both brought, like different qualities that uh, aligned and matched each other. So they chose us both. And I honestly, it has been like a dream team. I can't see it having just been one of us. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I love that we were both hired and we were both so excited to work with each other professionally because we hadn't got an opportunity to do that before. So yeah, that's my DNA story, how I came to this work. And um, that's my co-director, y'all. That's my co-director. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And we can go to the next slide. So um, we're talking about succession uh, reflections. And so uh, first and foremost, it was super important to begin our succession process with additional support um, we were looking for someone who was steeped in social justice values, who had experience with organizational development, and of course, a deep love for Detroit, like all of us, who identify um, very corely as Detroiters. So we brought on the wonderful Isabel Moses uh, to coach us through succession. And we highly recommend bringing on someone you deeply trust and respect, like we do Isabel to support these types of leadership transition. And so I'm going to pass it over to Isabel so she can share more about um, her personal journey and how she came to the work of supporting organizations and moving towards Black leadership and growing racial justice-based institutions. Thank you, Ryan. Um, next slide, please. And uh, we'll just leave it here for a moment and then you can pull it down. So I have been fortunate to be doing organizational development work in the nonprofit sector for about the last 15 years. And my story in some ways mirrors a lot of what Cornetta and Ryan have shared. I have been primarily working in white dominant contexts. I went to um, you know, elite schools <laughs> for my education and then was hired into con multiple consulting firms. I've actually been probably with five different consulting firms before. I recently took on a full-time role with a racial justice organization called Faith in Action, where I'm on staff as director of organizational development, as well as leading an independent coaching and consulting practice um, in my um, limited free time. But I uh, negotiated that actually in part because of some of what I learned in my journey, which is that very often in a lot of the white organizations, white dominant organizations where I worked, every time I had an idea or a vision or a way that I thought we could deepen our work, increase our impact, particularly working with leaders of color. Uh, the person I was reporting to, a white person, um, inevitably would say, Isabel, that's such a good idea. You should go do that someplace else. Or, um, or Isabel, that's such a great idea, but I don't really see how that fits with my vision. And then a couple months later, they would give the amazing idea that I had given them to some other person, usually a white colleague. And, um, and I just started to realize like, this is, this is not okay. And I would inevitably get another amazing opportunity and I would take that next role. Same thing would happen a couple years later. And then I would again realize that for me to manifest what I thought was necessary in leadership, I might actually have to create my own thing. Um, I was fortunate though in the meantime to get the opportunity to join Faith in Action, as I mentioned, which was itself going through a transition from white dominant leadership to black leadership. And we now have really an all person of color leadership team, as well as a majority POC staff um, around the country, which is really incredible. And I realized that I was also going through a process myself of deconditioning, decolonizing, unlearning whiteness and white dominant ways of being. And as part of that process, moved from Washington DC to Detroit about three years ago, because I also wanted to center my life and my work in 
Black community and be in deeper relationship with Black folks than I was able to be when I lived in Washington, D.C. So I recognize that my own journey in some ways mirrors the journey of a lot of the organizations that I am partnering with. And I see this as um, kind of an interesting parallel where, you know, the work that I'm doing personally, the work that many of us are doing personally and unlearning and deconditioning is, uh, again, mirroring and paralleling with a lot of the work organizations are doing to unlearn, decondition, and frankly, to come back to who we have always been and to reclaim Indigenous practices, to reclaim Black-centered ways of being, and to celebrate that and to figure out how we can actually make that vibrant in the organizations where we work. And to, and I know that I feel more full and more whole when I get to bring my full self into the workplace every day. And um, Alvin Herring, who's the executive director of Faith in Action, he really recently put out an intention. He really wants our organization to be the best possible place for Black folks and all people of color to work. And I'm, you know, I'll sign on for that vision and stay at that organization for a long time. And I'm also grateful that a lesson I learned was that I need to keep a little piece of my time for the for the projects that are passionate to me and not give my entire self over to one organization. So in starting my own independent practice, I've been able to partner with amazing organizations like DNA and a number of other organizations around the country and have been fortunate to partner with a number of leaders who are grappling with this question of how do I fully uh, embody the values that I care about in the organizational work that we do? How do we um, how do we unlearn, decenter whiteness and, and white leadership and create space and opportunity for leaders of color, particularly black leaders? So that's what we're gonna talk more about is that process and what that looks like within DNA. So we're now gonna go through a series of our top insights and we're gonna have an opportunity to get into more of a conversation across Bill Ryan, Cornetta, and, um, and we're gonna start with, if you go to the next slide, the, um, the first major point that we wanna lift up is co-creating shared values, culture, and vision. Since one of the first things that we worked on when I started working with the DNA team is really making sure that this culture and the vision and the values were collectively shared and held across all three co-directors. So um, Cornette, could you start by talking a little bit more about the process that you all have been using to, um, to do that work together? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, or Ryan, did you want to talk about uh, how we honor flexibility in the work? And then I'll, I'll uh, piggyback off of you. Oh, yeah, sure, 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 sure. So, um, so yeah, um, one of, or a few values that I'll share. Um, one of the biggest ones is that we honor flexibility in our work and we keep our communication open. So, like, an example of that is, you know, um, DNA quite busy for a three-person staff. <laughs> um, and we recognize that and we are planning to do some hiring soon to help support us. But um, I, we, um, so, so for example, we've had like a really busy um, month or week because of all of our programming and other commitments, then we have like a really um, open, honest policy with each other saying like, hey, I'm a bit burned out. Can we move, you know, some things around so that next week is clearer for us um, to prevent burnout, but also to um, just stay flexible in our work and honor what we all need. And um, another version of that um, is that we also value being adaptive to our needs as humans outside of work. So another example of that is um, last year, um, Cornetta was pregnant with the lovely legend, her almost one-year-old son, and um, both Il and I at different points needed to go out on medical leave. And so it was like kind of back to back to back, but we all were like, us as human beings being well, like um, Cornetta feeling like she could step away for her full maternity leave and not feel like, you know, she was missing anything or that she was letting the team down. Same for me and Ill, like having to step away to take care of our bodies and not feeling like, you know, we were missing anything or missing work. Um, we, we all have a very open sort of like um, and holistic approach to caring for each other as four humans. So those are some values that uh, are definitely super important to us at DNA. And I'll pass it over to Cornetta to expand on a few other things. Yeah, I mean, just about the the whole um, seeing each other as human. 
um, when COVID hit, we immediately knew that we wanted to um, reduce the amount of time that we spent on screen, um, that we want to reduce the amount of meetings or yeah, the, the number of meetings that we have per week. Um, I think the thing that we weren't um, realizing that we would, you know, hit so soon was grief because all of us lost uh, some folks um, along the way. And so, you know, if we needed to step away, if we couldn't make a meeting, if um, we weren't necessarily fully present because we were holding on to the fact that there's a global pandemic, not only of, of um, you know, COVID-19, but also anti-Black racism, um, we could do that without any recourse, without feeling like I was going to get fired. <laughs> um, and because I even know of an organization that actually did a, a staff evaluation in the middle of a pandemic. And I just thought to myself, like, wow, that's, that's wild to me. Like, everyone is holding so much. And to add the anxiety of I'm about to lose my job because I'm not performing at optimal peak just feels inhumane to me. Um, and I was just really glad that we as a leadership team um, said that we, we, <laughs> we weren't going to evaluate ourselves in that way um, and that we were going to take one day at a time. Um, so we honor each other as, as humans first. Um, another thing that we had was uh, multiple resources for coaching support. So Isabel supported us with um, succession planning and we had another coach who supported us with um, culture work. Um, Cause as an organization, that's, that's really important. Um, we are as leaders expected to have answers all the time. Well, we don't, <laughs> uh, that's where, you know, coaching comes in. Um, we practice emergent strategy and it is fundamental to how we do our work. So Il mentioned emergent strategy earlier today, Adrian Marie Brown's book, really taps into that. And we encourage you all to go check that book out. Um, and then as a cultural norm, um, together, we all um, really value learning together. So we actually rotate um, who leads our um, study group. We, you know, find a principal or something that we just, we just, we are interested in. Um, Black feminist thought, um, um, you know, how, learning, different learning, different learning styles. Um, we, speaking of one year old, here's, here's my one year old, he's coming in. Um, <laughs> uh, but we, we, we all really value like learning as a, as a team. And so we do have study groups. And then we also embarked upon um, like a year long learning journey where we basically try to understand the last five years of DNA uh, and uh, for the purpose of us co-leading, you know, in the future and identifying and transitioning uh, leadership in a healthy way. Hey, y'all, this is, this is legend William Smith, my son. Um, but yeah, so just being adaptive. So like um, the humanness of this. So this happens all the time where he's taking my, <laughs> my mic. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it over <laughs> back to Isabel. <laughs> Thank you, Cornetta, and thank you, Legend, for gracing us. We love you so much. Um, and this is a great illustration, right? Like, bring your baby. This We love it when you bring your baby. He frightens all of us so much. Um, and I think this is actually a great segue into disrupting white supremacist culture, which is one of the next principles that we wanted to lift up. If you could um, just flash the next slide, please. So that's our kind of second key point. You can go ahead and take it down. Um, and we wanted to talk about the truth of the matter, which is that one of the biggest barriers for uh, this type of transition is the funding and financial um, constraints that are often put upon organizations to begin with. And then you layer that on top of the lack of access to networks that many Black and people of color leaders face. So Il, can you talk a little bit about some of the ways that you have been intentional about disrupting um, some of these practices and being really intentional about trans transitioning um, the relationships to Ryan and Cornetta? For sure. Ryan, would you be open to start and then I'll, I'll add? Sure. Yeah, I can start. So um, uh, one big part of um, the funding piece, uh, especially transitioning from white leadership to black leadership is uh, transitioning those relationships. And so 
one of the things that we um, have talked about as a staff is that outside of just um, executive leadership being the folks to meet with um, funders and to build those relationships, as we hire more people in and expand our staff, we think all staff should be invited to the table with those funders so that um, relationship building is happening with everyone. And to a point that Cornetta made earlier, um, as we hire people and, you know, want to um, see them grow within the org and, you know, possibly become leaders of the org later on, that's really important to start those, uh, rela that relationship building when they are, um, you know, a coordinator or an administrative assistant or something like that. And not only that, but, you know, I've been, when I first started working in like the arts and cultural nonprofit sector, you know, I had that experience of when you, when you're not in a leadership position, kind of feeling like, you know, um, you don't get to go to the important meetings or you like your voice is not heard in that. And so we want to change that culture as well. So that like, no matter what your position is on the staff, like you're being introduced to people, you um, feel valued, et cetera. So um, outside of that, we also, um, with our funders and in um, funder education uh, endeavors that we're a part of, we're naming that we need three to five year generational operation, or I'm sorry, three to five year general operations funding so that we're set up to be financially sustainable um, and that we don't have to, you know, worry um, the way that a lot of um, organizations that tend to be led by people of color have had to worry about money year to year. Um, we also want to bring in funders as partners to support black and brown leaders um, so that the org is financially stable. And so, again, through the funder education, um, like we're, we're part of a design team um, of national organizations where we do funder education work. And uh, a big part of the education is telling funders that we need to set su successors of color up for financial success. And some of the ways to do that are through like guaranteeing funding for several years, um, operational funding, not just, you know, specific funding on a, a program or a project. Um, another thing is relationship building is key with everyone. So like outside of funders, um, us, you know, building relationships with, other organizations that are like our sibling orgs um, in the field, also giving space to the leaders, um, Cornetta and I, new uh, successors of color to learn and grow, um, not expecting perfectionism because that is a white supremacist value and also just giving us space as um, new, you know, new co-directors to, to grow, learn, um, make mistakes, et cetera. And then also naming the power dynamics of switching from white lead to black lead. And so with that, I'll pass it over to Il to, to give some more examples of ways we're disrupting. For sure, yeah, I think that piece that you just shared, like naming the power dynamics of, of a white lead or um, to moving to, in this case, you know, to black women, co-directors, lifelong Detroiters, um, in the landscape that Isabel, you described earlier of like, we just know statistically such um, consistently groups are defunded when you have these transitions happen. You know, when a, when a founder leaves, that's a, a fear and some that people are concerned about. But then when you have the added layer of, you know, white supremacist culture and funding, then you're dealing with um, potential blowback and loss of support and funding. And so for us, we name that. We name that explicitly when we talk to funders. We say, hey, can you help be partners to us in countering this really problematic and racist trend of you know, Black-led organizations being funded less to do work in Black communities? That's really messed up. And we know that you have, um, we're lucky to have a lot of folks that are grant makers that are value aligned to us. So we know they have shared values. And can we partner together to you know, put pressure on whoever the decision-making boards are at your foundation or in the field with your peers to like say, hey, let's let's address this head on around not just funding, but also around relationship building, who holds relationships, who's who's deferred to, who's the expert. And we've had to name that explicitly too. Like we'll be 
in meetings with partners and because people know me or are more familiar with me and because of people's tendency to defer to whiteness as um, you know, having more expertise, then people might defer to me in certain instances where all of us have um, shared information, shared context to speak to it. So I'll, you know, sometimes more subtly just you know, pass the mic back to Ryan or Cornetta to speak to it, but sometimes more explicitly be like, hey, y'all, can we not do the thing where I get looked at as, you know, the masculine perceived white person that has all the answers? Like, that's not what we're doing. That's not what we're up to. Can we just name it and counter that directly? Um, so naming that is key. Um, and, and then also like how that shows up interpersonally. So first and foremost, like for us internally as a team, like, you know, I, I used to be a uh, touring musician and my, one of my first records I ever released was with, with my crew Anomalies with my homegirl Halix and it was called Perfectionists. Okay, so perfectionism runs deep in my bones. My mom is an immigrant who, you know, her whole thing is like perfectionism, urgency, that's what's gonna protect you from, you know, that's what's, that's what's gonna help you survive. And then you, and then you internalize that. So I've definitely internalized urgency, perfectionism, workaholism, all those things unproudly. And then all those things perpetuate white supremacist culture, right? And so as Ryan and Cornetta came into the org, it was like, how do we very intentionally counter that? Like making a really open space for feedback so that they could give me feedback when I was perpetuating those cultures or where any of us were, but especially me. And then additionally, um, me being able to self-reflect, be accountable, and also me, me uh, stepping up to the plate when we work with partners, especially white dominant organizational partners, and they're perpetuating that culture of perfectionism, of urgency, of um, other white dominant um, organizational just practices that end up being very harmful and putting a lot of extra labor on uh, black women leaders in this instance, Ryan and Cornetta. And so I, you know, I've had additional meetings or side conversations with white partners to like really try to disrupt, address head on, do extra um, labor to be able to, to in some ways intervene on that becoming the work that Ryan and Cornetta have to do. Um, or sometimes having to make decision that we don't take on certain partnerships because they perpetuate those dynamics. And then I'll, I just want to circle back one last thing around feedback is like, you know, we have this really open space for feedback, for non-defensive receiving of feedback and being able to share it with each other in loving and caring ways. But I think that's especially important for myself, for other white folks in leadership roles in any kind of collaborative role to be able to listen, receive, believe um, black folks, black women, black transgender non-conformed people, um, you know, indigenous and brown folks that are telling you yo, this is how your whiteness is showing up in the room, you know, as a white body person and um, how to really ground, listen, be in dignity, be in um, solidarity and co-liberation when those uh, pieces of feedback come up. And then additionally, I've had to learn to fall back on giving feedback because a lot of my feedback was rooted in me trying to replicate what my standards were versus now moving to a place where I do my best to give feedback when asked for that feedback. and just um, basically moving forward and following the leadership of Ryan and Cornetta and being able to set new standards and um, still principle and value aligned standards, but ones that are more reflective of the culture and values that, that, um, that they bring to the table uniquely. And so I'm going to transition us. I know we're running low on time. All right. If y'all want to add so. anything. Well, I'm going to go ahead and move us along to the next point we wanted to lift up, which is around intentional transition. So I'm going to suggest, um, Cornetta, if you could speak to this, and then we'll try to make sure we hit all the points and have a little time for questions at the end. Yes, thank you, Isabel. And I'll be quick on this. So um, <clears throat> we, we were really intentional about just like um, uh, making sure that um, that relationship building that we were talking about earlier um, and how, um, you know, that takes time. So we can't just like be introduced to someone and then that's it. We have to be introduced to a person, to a partner, to a funder and actually have time to start building that relationship. And so we were, um, we would suggest or make the suggestion that when transitioning have a long enough runway so that it doesn't feel rushed, but that it's short enough um, to not overextend. 
and that we move at a speed of trust. Um, that is a value of ours to, to move at a, at a speed of trust. So building those relationships intentionally so that it doesn't feel um, rushed, but actually like we're actually building onto something. And then um, succession planning as a value, um, you know, um, we knew from the beginning that ill was going to transition out. And so that's how we approached the work. Um, um, having that always in mind um, helped with just being intentional about, you know, the, the transition. Um, but then also, um, even for me, like I'm thinking about the next Detroiter who can take my place. I'm thinking about the next um, young person of color who, um, you know, I have something that I'm going to add to DNA. Um, but I'm hoping and I'm looking for someone to come in maybe as an associate so that they can be grounded in the ways of DNA and then uh, uh, train them up to be leaders within the organization so they can take it on to the next level. Um, that is a value of ours um, and very, um, and we're very intentional about that. That's great. So that once the second to last point is around clear roles and timeline. Ryan, can you speak to this one? Yes, yes, I can. So um, as far as like clear roles and timeline, um, uh, well, first of all, we've been focusing on our internal and external communications. So um, we, you know, sat down with Isabel and developed a communications plan about how we would tell people um, about this transition. So um, we decided to share with our like, share with our funders um, individually, like have some, um, you know, invite them to connect, especially because of COVID and everything, it had been a while um, since we connected with folks. So like just do some like relationship building and then in um, those private conversations, share with them the, um, the, the transition plan. And so um, that's how we've been dealing with it internally. And then externally, um, we've started to let our other partners know um, and other you know people we work with or collaborate with. And so now it's like fairly public. It still hasn't been like a huge announcement, but also like in our programming um, or like in our partnerships, like you can see ill, like if, if people are paying attention, they can see ill like, stepping back and me and Cornetta like take like heading everything up. So um and, and we're going to we're actually gonna have like a fifth year um virtual celebration that's also like a farewell um on the leadership end to ill. So that's kind of like where the big big announcement is gonna happen. But people people know. So that's how we've handled uh communication. And then um in terms of like uh, some pitfalls that have happened um, or in terms of um, other things that we're aware of in, in terms of timeline and role is um, developing our roles. So like when we came in, we knew we were co-directors and uh, both Cornette and I were given titles, like I'm the director of program, um, Cornetta is the director of community impact. And so we've had to like flesh those roles out um, just depending on our duties, um, our strengths, and just sort of what our interests were in the uh, co-director position anyway. So um, yeah, our timeline is like at the end of 2020, um, it will transition completely out. And then starting in 2021, um, Cornetta and I will be the two um, co-directors, and then we have Il as our advisor who will be in that role. All right. Well, Cornetta, uh, we want to go ahead and invite you to share our last point since this might be a great one to close on. And we're so sorry we weren't able to take questions, but we hope this has been um, rich and fulfilling, and we'd love to engage with you um, offline. Yes. So the last one is, is uh, system-wise change is needed, but it's not uniform. We must be adaptive to community needs. One size does not fit all. This is this is our story and not a blueprint. Print. Um, start with principles. Start with listening with communities and building relationships, and then go from there. Um, and all with right. that.
thank you. Um, and this is how to stay connected with us. Um, oh, so real, real quick. We just want to um, thank Andrea Lust and Hope Simon for the ASL interpretation. Yes. And the National Captioning Institute for live captioning um, because they were able to make this seminar um discussion more accessible so thank yes you. thank you y'all thanks everybody thanks thank you for the thanks invitation for thank you to the international documentary association we're so grateful to be here enjoy the rest of the conference yep and hit us up if y'all got questions peace bye